Many of you may know for the last two weeks, I've literally feel, I feel like I've been all, all the way around the world as I um, have traveled up east all the way around to uh, Narita, Japan, and then on to Seoul, South Korea, and then on to Osaka, or Osaka, as they pronounce it in Japan, uh, Japan, and then on down to Cairns, and then down ultimately to Sydney, Australia. In my body, it is now 2.03 a.m. So I'm coming to your house to preach the rest of the message at 2 a.m. tomorrow morning in your house. Now, what an incredible, incredible trip. I got to go to the largest Methodist church in the world, 100 pastors, some 150,000 people, a part of that church, and then went to the largest Christian church in the world in Seoul at Yoida Full Gospel Church, a million members, literally a fifth of the size of the state of Alabama are a part of that one church. And they've spun off all kind of other churches as well. Nothing in the states is even close. There's, if you put the top 20 together, it's not touching that. And then went from there and got down to Hillsong Church in Sydney, which was amazing as well. So my heart is just wow, and almost outside of my body in this moment and with excitement. To be home, though, I'll just tell you, as great as all those places were, I kept thinking while I was there, I miss home. I miss home. I miss my family, my, my immediate family, my extended church family. And, and I'll just tell you, there's no place in the world I would rather be right now in this moment than right with you. And so for those of you in this room, I tell you, I'm glad to be home and, and thank you for blessing me. Thank you, David, for bringing two great messages on the, the, the uh, King and Shepherd David. And thank you to all of our staff that did a great job while I was away. I know we had a couple of big funerals as well and, and the concert Friday night and then the trunk or treat Wednesday night. And uh, I was watching all the pictures scrolling uh, from the other side of the world, uh, praying for and excited for our church family to experience all that we did while I've been away. But it's good to be home. It's really good to be home. I have the privilege to celebrate baptisms this morning and welcoming new members to our family and meeting new uh, family, uh, that are some that are brand new today and some of you that have been gone for a long time. We're glad to have you home as well. Uh, it's, it's incredible to be here. And I have to say, we're kicking off a brand new sermon series called Words of Life, as you saw in the bumper today. And, and I just want to tell you, I think this could be one of the most important sermon series you've ever heard leading up to Thanksgiving, where you're going to be, some of you, together with family that you only get to see maybe once a year or twice a year. And as you sit around that, that uh, table there, part of what I've been preparing and trying to help equip you with as we get ready to, to be in that place and then going into Advent, working our way up to a manger to welcome Christ into the world again. Yeah, I, I'm so grateful for this series to have a chance to really posit into you some key words of life that I believe we're all called to speak and I, I believe every one of us, whether you are right now a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent, or whether you are not yet engaged or dating or, or a parent at all, uh, I believe that this sermon series, this message in particular on parenting, could be one of the most important that I've ever shared. I believe all of us have in our mind's eye that we will be a great parent before we are. And I believe some of us, when we become a parent, we think, well, I was going to be better at this than I am. And some of us have regret that we weren't all that we were called to be or should be. And some of you today are regretting that maybe you didn't have the parents you would like to have had. Maybe they didn't know how to or weren't able to, for whatever reasons, do the things that I believe are modeled for us of what it looks like to be a good, maybe even a great parent. And I, today I want to I give this to you and I want to uh, let it let it change perhaps your life and the lives of those that you touch and impact through the example that we find in Matthew 3 of the father speaking to the son. I'm so grateful that Jesus is the king, he's the ruler, he's the judge, that God is the creator, he's all those things. He's mighty, he's powerful and all that. But before he's anything else, I submit to you that when Jesus teaches us to pray, he starts out by saying, our father. So it's not only that God is able to do all things through his powerful nature as creator, ruler, judge, all that, but he's intimate enough as a parent, as father to be accessible and desiring to do as well. So I'm going to invite you today, out of reverence for God's most precious and holy word, to stand as we read Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17. 
And I want you to hear these words with new ears. I want you to hear this in a way that could transform everything. Then Jesus came to Galilee, to the Jordan, to John, to be baptized by him. And John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so now. For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he, being John, consented. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were opened to him. And he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove coming to rest on him. And behold... A voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Be to God. Amen. You may be seated. I want to ask you two questions as we dive in here this morning. The first is this, when have you most needed a parent to act in your life? For those of you who are watching online, let me also say welcome to you. I know we have people literally every week that watch from all, over, all around the globe, and we're delighted to have you from the different places you watch this morning as well. When have you most needed a parent to act in your life? Think about that time where life was the most turbulent or scary or unknown or fearful or uh, confused, whatever it was. When have you most needed a parent to act in your life? Just get that in your head. And then the other time, the other thing I want to ask you to wrestle with this morning is what words from a parent, this could be positive or negative, what words from a parent have most impacted you in your life? What words that your father, your mother have spoken over you that even today in this moment, either for good or for bad, you still are blessed by or cursed by? What words echoed through your head as I asked that question? Some of you are sitting near a parent and y'all may be chuckling as you think about some of the words you've spoken to each other. Some moments in life are so significant. That, now watch this. They're so significant that they, there's like everything that happened before this and then everything that happens after this. I remember being in sixth grade and watching for the first time the Thriller video. I'm going to date myself here. Uh, so I've just separated the room of who's, who, what age is in the room. There was who had seen the video and who had not seen the video, right? I mean, you were in one of those two categories. So if you're 40 plus, you're, you're with me. You, you know what I'm saying? If you're younger, you're, gonna, you're just old. That's okay. There are moments and situations, things that look like, it's like everything before this and everything after this. So in, in the Jewish community, you have a, a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah where a boy becomes a man, a girl becomes a woman. In, in, in our community, you have confirmation where you, you were a child, a preparatory member of the church all the way up until this point. And then there's this point where you become a full member for the rest of your life. There's, for some of you, it was getting a driver's license. There was, I was not mobile, but now I got the license and I got wheels, baby. You know, here we go. There, there's everything before here and after here. It's like this point of demarcation that changes everything. I was single, now I'm married. You, you could walk through several of those in your own life. But let me suggest to you this morning that this scripture, this point right here in Matthew 3 is everything Jesus has been learning and growing and becoming all the way up to this point. And then from here forward, the rest of his life, it's going to set up this three-year window of his public ministry. Everything changes here. He's been learning and growing and being in his father's house and going to Jerusalem with his parents each year for Passover and learning and connecting with other leaders and all that. But from here forward... He's no longer a boy. He's a man. And, and this moment sets up everything here as we dive into this scripture this morning. The baptism of Jesus, this, this little section of scripture holds the word behold two times. And I don't want you to miss this. These two times that behold shows up, the first time it precedes the Holy Spirit descending like a dove on Jesus. And behold, and the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove comes and lands or lights or hovers over Jesus, descends on him. And, and the second time it says behold, and then the Father speaks words that we all need to hear. 
I would suggest to you this morning that whenever we find that word behold in Scripture, it, we probably need to lean in a little closer because of whatever it is God's about to say or do. And two times here in this scripture, behold shows up once for what he's about to do and the next for what he's about to say. Brings me to the first blank. A good parent moves down. A good parent moves down toward their child. Here again, Matthew 3, 16. And when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water and behold... The heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. You see, when I was a little boy, I was so afraid of the dark, and I would I would literally wake up in the middle of the night sometimes screaming and crying, and my parents would come running in and and they would say, What's the matter? And I'd say, I had a bad dream, and they'd say, It's gonna be okay. And I'd say, No, it's not. It's dark, it's scary. I don't know if I can make it till morning. I'm certain something's going to get me. And, and they, would, they would come down by my bed and they'd say, Honey, it's going to be okay. I say, I, they said, Jesus is always with you. And I said, Yeah, but I need Jesus with skin on. Stick around. You know, it's, I'm scared. It's so important that, that a parent comes down to where their child is. The Spirit of God descends on Jesus at his baptism, much the way that... In Genesis 1, we find that the, the Spirit hovered over the waters of creation. Remember? It, the, the Spirit's hovering over the waters of creation, and it says it this way. That the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. You talk about darkness. No light has been created yet. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Most theologians also believe this, the dove is the perfect example for the Holy Spirit to come and descend down over Jesus because remember what it was in Genesis 8 when the earth is being destroyed by the flood and what do they send out to come back with an olive branch? A dove, right? It's a dove. A dove comes back with an olive branch and brings it back and, and the world is being recreated in this moment here in Genesis 8 with Noah in the ark, and the world, in essence, is being recreated in the life of Jesus. There's this fall of Adam and humanity and all of that. And, and, but when Jesus comes, the Spirit lights on him. The hope of Jesus is coming to a new place in the world. The goal of Jesus being baptized, according to verse 15, was to fulfill all righteousness. Now, I don't have time to get deep into this this morning, but that word righteousness, fulfilling all righteousness, Matthew is consumed with. It shows up seven times in the Gospel of Matthew alone, most of them in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through chapter 7. Discipleship, for I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. In, in Matthew 6, 1, beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Or Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And it also talks about the coming of the kingdom through righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for Righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. Or Matthew 5.10. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It even goes on to talk about later in Matthew's gospel. About John who came to you in the way of righteousness. But you didn't believe him. In Matthew 21 also. Talking about John again. That he, he came from where. When Jesus asked where did John come from. And. And they say from, he says, from heaven or from man. And they discuss it among themselves and say, if we say from heaven, then he'll say to us, why then did you not believe him? You see, Jesus was baptized for a different reason than we are. Precious Layla this morning was baptized. And as she was baptized, there were several things happening in this moment. One is she's being claimed by God. She's making a public witness to what God has done in her. That the Holy Spirit is coming on her. That we say that you are baptized by water and the Spirit. When John baptized, he baptized for repentance. When Jesus says the baptism is coming, it's for um, the Holy Spirit to come with fire. It's what happens in Pentecost later that, they, that they're to wait in Jerusalem until the, the Holy Spirit comes upon them in Acts 2. And, and then they can become the witnesses that he's talked about. That, that this righteousness, that Jesus, why in the world would Jesus need to be baptized? As I read the scripture, I just kept wrestling with why, why was Jesus baptized? He was already righteous. 
Not only that, but he already had the Holy Spirit. Remember, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. We say it whenever we say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was already, he came to the world with the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I want to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Here's what was, here's what was happening. As he's, as he's being baptized, he's modeling for us what we are to do. As we make that public profession that he's modeling while he was sinless, he didn't need to be washed of sin. He, he, he was baptized so he could become one with humanity. And through baptism, what we do is we become one with his righteousness. That we, we put on Christ in baptism and Christ is being prepared to put on our sinfulness to the cross. You see, a parent, a good parent moves down toward their children. Like a father moves down to play tea with his daughter. It's precious. A mother moves down to celebrate dates with her son. And it's beautiful. A father moves down to play ball and let his children win if he can. It's empowering. A mother moves down to... to Teach your children how to tie their shoes, to kiss boo-boos, and to graciously lose. And that's of utmost importance. You see, a good parent moves down to their child, but a good parent also does something else very, very important. That's your second blank today. A good parent lifts up their child. A good parent, that's your blank, lifts up their child. Here again, Matthew 3, 17. And behold, the second behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved son, With whom I am well pleased. We're baptized to receive the Holy Spirit. But Jesus was conceived in that Holy Spirit. You may recall Jesus uh, when he goes to Nazareth. uh, Isaiah 61.1 is the scripture he reads. And he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach good news. He has anointed me to to care for to the poor, to set up the, uh, sent up me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to open uh, prison doors for those who are bound, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. As soon as Jesus was baptized down in the Jordan River Valley and came up, the Father spoke and lifted him up even higher. In, in this moment, Jesus showed that he was one with humanity by being baptized. But the Father showed that he is one forever with divinity as he spoke those words, this is my son. Now here's the most important part of this message today I don't want you to miss. The father spoke and proclaimed three things that I want you to write down. Because I think these three things, every child anywhere ever needs to hear these words from their parents. Every child. I I believe these three words, if, if people really, if every child really truly understood these three words, it would empty out our prisons. It would, it would eliminate the need for so many of our alternative schools. It would, it would transform our world because every child needs to know these three statements. Number one, I'm glad you're mine. I'm glad you're mine. This is my beloved child. This is my beloved son, the father says to Jesus, of Jesus. The second is that I love you. This is my beloved child, not just my child. I mean, some of you, this has been like when you walked in and you had the parent-teacher conference or met with the principal and they said, whose child is this? And you said, this is my child. You know, that's not the, kind of, that's not the way the father's saying of Jesus. No, he says, this is my child. This is my beloved child. I'm glad you're mine and I love you. And the third statement, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. Matthew 3, 17, Jesus is preparing to fulfill the words of Isaiah 53, 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. Jesus in this moment has, has heard the father say, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. Your child needs to hear these words from you, parent. If you're not yet a parent, one day your children need to hear these words from you. Some of you are are saying right now, I wish I would have heard those words from a parent. 
I wish my parent now would say that or my grandparent now would say that. Some of you are saying my parents gone, but I wish they would have said those words to me. And not just said those words, but showed those words. That's why, behold, and the dove comes down as the Holy Spirit to land on Jesus. The Father shows it, and then the Father says it. As Jesus faithfully experienced the waters of baptism to show he was with us, the Father showed that he was always with him. You see, Jesus came low so we could go high. Jesus took sin's punishment so, to the cross so we, through baptism, can take his righteousness for eternity. In Matthew 3, 16, we see God's consecration through the dove-like Holy Spirit. And in Matthew 17, we hear God's affirmation through his booming voice. A good parent consecrates their child through action. And affirms their child through words. I've stood on this stage many times to celebrate a life. Some of your family members, parents, grandparents. And and as I've stood on the stage and I've talked about their life and I've met with the family beforehand, I, I don't want it to be said when I prepare to do your funeral one day. I don't want it to be said, well, they sometimes said they loved me, but they never showed it. Oh, I don't want it either to be said, well, they sometimes showed they loved me by what they gave me or did for me or whatever else, but they never said it. The Father in this moment shows it and says it. Do you, parent? Now, let me be clear, students. When I was your age, I thought I was going to be a perfect parent. I mean, I thought I'd like have it going on. I, you know, if I saw parents that were not engaged, I was going to be engaged. If I saw parents that were hovering and overpowering and overbearing, I thought, well, no, I'm going to be that cool parent, you know. No. A, a good parent, if you want to be a good parent, I believe that, that the father is showing us how to be a good parent by moving down toward his child, Jesus, and by lifting up his child. This is my son whom I love. With him, I'm well pleased. But there's a third thing. There's a third thing that a good parent, if you want to be, if you want to be a good, a great parent, that I believe that we're called to do just like the Father does here in, the, in Matthew's gospel. A good parent reminds their child who they are. Reminds their child. So we, we start, our bulk of our scripture today is here in Matthew 3, where Jesus is baptized, comes up out of the water, and hears these profound words, the dove descends down on Jesus. But 14 chapters later, we're getting toward the end of the gospel of Matthew, and once again, we're going to hear these same three statements, and then one more added to it, and it's a Mount Transfiguration. Jesus has been doing his public ministry, he's coming to the end of his time, he's making his way to Jerusalem, he's headed toward the cross. And just before they get to Jerusalem, Jesus with his inner three disciples, James and John and Peter, are gathered there on Mount Transfiguration. And the Father, once again, the skies are open. The Father speaks, and he says these same words. He was still speaking when, behold, again, that key word, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Peter, one of those three disciples on Mount Transfiguration that day, who's, he's the one who says, it's good that we should be here. Let's build structures. Let's have something here for Moses and Elijah. And I don't have time to get into all that, why it was Moses and Elijah on Mount Transfiguration. But in this moment, Peter reflects back as he writes in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's talking about what happened back here in Matthew 17. For when we received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, the skies opened and God spoke, he recounts exactly what what God said of his son. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. It impacted Peter to hear what the father said to Jesus. Some of us are guilty of saying in private what we should say in public. We're guilty of just saying quietly and and inside here, hey, I'm proud of you. Good job. No, sometimes we need to say, this is my child whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. I just want you to know I'm so proud of my child. 
When the father said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased, the original language is so much more powerful than, than our translation. And all we hear is, this is my child with whom I'm well pleased. What, what the Greek word for with whom I'm well pleased actually means is, with whom I've always been well pleased. With who, in this moment, I'm well pleased. And, and don't miss this, with whom I will always be well pleased. When you graduate, when you throw the winning pitch, when, when you get the promotion at work, when you have, get married, when you do something really good, it's one thing to hear, I'm proud of you. I'm so proud of you. That's important in that moment. But how much more powerful is it to hear, I've always been proud of you. And, and I'm proud of you right here in this moment. You've done a great job. You've worked hard. You've given your best. I'm so proud. But let me just promise you, this is far more powerful. When the crowd fades away and no one else is there to pat you on the back, when everyone else is gone, I'm still going to be proud of you. I'm not proud because in, just, just the, in this moment, Jesus, you fulfilled all righteousness. I'm not proud just because in this moment you've done the right thing. I'm always proud to be your dad, the Father says. You can't, you can't lose it. It's, it's uncontrollable. It's uncontainable. It's unconditional. My love of you is so great. And how proud of you I am doesn't come and go. It does, it's not like waves that ebb and flow. Hmm. Matt, Matthew 3, 17 and Matthew 17, 5. Both of these places are reminders of who Jesus is. And the Father delights to remind Jesus who he is. And not only that, but he delights to remind us who we are in light of who Jesus is. In Matthew 3, 16, I don't have time to unpack this fully, but it says the heavens were opened. And when the heavens are opened, there's, it's like there's this time of reminding who Jesus is. And that God speaks like there's words of revelation and remembrance when the heaven, whenever the heavens are open. Let me, let me just quickly give you a few examples. Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1. In the 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was among the exiles by Chabar Canal, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Or Isaiah 64, 1 and 2. Oh, that you would rend the heavens, open the heavens, and come down that the mountains might quake at your presence. At, at the stoning of the first Christian martyr, Stephen, in Acts 7, Verse 56, and he said, behold, again that word, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. That God's opening the heavens to remind Stephen, even in this moment, empowering him of who he is and whose he is. And, and maybe one of my favorites here, and you'll understand why in a second, in Acts 10, 11, And I saw the heavens opened again. And something like a great sheet descending and being let down by its four corners of the earth. It's this moment where Peter realizes, oh man, we get to eat bacon and ham. Praise the Lord. Pork chops. It's all good. You can eat everything. Every kind of food. It's good because the heavens are open and the Lord speaks and reveals. Not only that, but even... At the call of the disciples. And he said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open, Jesus speaking. And angels of God ascending, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. You see, a, parent, a good parent knows that their child needs to hear over and over and over again. Often and consistently who they are. And whose they are. And whom they represent. I am eternally grateful that God didn't just speak at the beginning of creation and say, let there be light and land and oceans and sun and stars and fish to fill the seas and birds to fill the air and animals to crawl the ground and, and, and then be done speaking. I'm grateful that he didn't get to day six and say, let us make man in our image. And, and then he went on to, it's the only day that he actually says, and it was very good. I'm so grateful that that wasn't God's last word. He's spoken in every generation. 
I'll be with you. I'll be, you'll be my people and I'll be your God. I'll be with you even to the very end of the age. I'm with you. You're mine. You belong to me. No one can take you out of my hand. He speaks over and over and over. As the band was singing this morning, all my life you have been faithful. Something was just breaking in me. I thought about, literally, I've had like 20 God appointments over the last two weeks with every flight attendant on the flights and people at the hotels and the waiter or waitress at the restaurant and people that we just happened to go by at Bondi Beach or Manly or at different, people that walked us on the tours around the different churches. And over and over, I just kept thinking, so many of these people, the conversations, God just did some amazing things. People that desperately needed to hear from a parent, this is my child, whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. The last conversation, I won't tell you her name, but was with a a flight attendant on the last flight. And as, as we were preparing to fly into Birmingham, thank you, Jesus, we were finally preparing to fly into Birmingham after Sydney to LAX and LAX to Charlotte and Charlotte to Birmingham. It was a circuitous route home. But as we're getting ready to finally land back home last night, I was talking with this lady, and and I I just asked her, I said, what's the prayer of your heart? And tears began to stream down her face. This perfect stranger she met on the plane. We had been flying all the way, and and she said, I've got got children I want you to pray for. And she gave me their names. She said, "My, my dad died about a year and a half ago. And um, I just never had the relationship with my dad I wanted. I just, I don't know where he is. I just, I want, I want a peace that he's okay. As I thought about this message that I've been working on all week. And how, how desperately many of us desire, I think all of us desire to be a good parent. That the words she needed to hear are the words that Jesus heard. And the words that maybe you need to hear today. And some of you say, Pastor, you don't understand. I didn't get these things spoken into me. Well, I'm sorry you didn't. But that doesn't excuse your responsibility to put these words into your children. You, you could be the one who breaks the cycle and says, so I didn't have a parent who knew how to speak these words. I'm glad you're mine. I, I'm, I love you and I'm proud of you. You have a call to speak those words into your children, whether you had them spoken into you or not. You, you, and not just to speak them, but to show them. The, the dove descended and landed on Jesus, hovered over Jesus to create something beautiful in this moment. Not just for Jesus, but for all of those. Peter's going to reference back to it. Everyone else who's listening in. This morning, my prayer for you is that you would get this. And whether it's today or next week or at Thanksgiving table, at some place, somewhere in your life, you would posit, place, put these words on and in those you love. Children who need to hear it. The year before I came to Clear Branch, I had... I picked up this scripture, and I didn't. There are a whole bunch of revelations I've just shared with you that I didn't have that as I preached this message about the key words. I'm glad you're mine. I love you, and I'm proud of you. And uh, just before we moved here, a, a man named Tony. I'll just leave it at Tony. His um, he he showed me what it is to truly cherish the woman he loved. For the last 10 years of her life, she had had Alzheimer's and he would get up every morning and he would go and he would take her fresh fruit for breakfast and he would feed it to her and then he would be with her through lunchtime and he'd feed her lunch and he'd be there in the afternoon and he would brush her hair out before bedtime and he would once again give her fresh fruit each each evening after dinner and many times he would he would curl up next to her in the bed and he would fall asleep there at the assisted living place where she was living the nursing home where she was living and and he would get up and he would go back to his house to wake up and just do the whole routine over the next day Monday through Friday Actually, Monday through Saturday. On Sunday, he would just go in the afternoon after church. 
So Tony, I, I was feeling a heart of compassion towards watching the faithfulness of this man. And so after preaching a sermon on these three statements, I'm glad you're mine, I love you, and I'm proud of you. Um, he and I went to, I was thinking I was going to take this precious guy to lunch, and he ended up blessing me in far greater ways as we went to visit his wife. Just a few months later, she passed away. And at the funeral, his children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren were all gathered there in the room. And, and in the service, he stood up and he turned to them and he said, I just want you to know that your mother, your grandmother, your great-grandmother, and I are so glad you're mine, ours. We love you more than we could ever fully express in word or deed. And we couldn't be more proud of you. What a dry eye in the house. Incredible, incredible to hear this patriarch of this family use this moment to speak life into those he loved, even as he stood before death in a casket of the woman he loved. Today, I want you to hear these words from the father, the best father ever. This is my beloved child whom I love with whom I'm well pleased. The question is, will you be that kind of parent? Are you exhibiting those marks of a good parent? Are you, are you speaking life into the ones you love? Whether you're a parent now or grandparent or great-grandparent or whether you in the future will be, I hope you will live these words out. Are you showing the marks of a good parent in word and deed. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us for how slow we are to speak the words of life into those we love most. Forgive us for the times we have said the words but not shown it by our actions. Forgive us for the times that we've been comfortable to show the actions but failed to live it out and speak it with our words. Forgive us for the times we've only said it privately and not been willing to say publicly, oh, I'm so proud of my child. I love my child. I'm so glad they're mine. Forgive us for failing to remember that anything worth saying is worth saying again and again and again. Help us to follow your example, Lord. Help us to speak in a way that our children can hear. Help us to speak in a way that others can hear. Help us to show our love by action and speak our love out loud. Help us to remind our children that we are glad that they're ours. Help us to remind our children that we love them beyond our words and what they could ever fully express. And God, help us to remind our children that we're proud of them in good times and to do so even more in the difficult times. Help us to remind our children that we believe in them even when they don't. Help us to remind our children that we believe in them even when it feels like to them no one else does. And I pray this prayer in the powerful enough name of the beloved son Jesus. And all God's people said, amen and amen. This morning, I'm going to dismiss you from this place. And I, I, I just want to send you out with two challenges. One, let's do this. Let's, let's speak this. Let's, let's live this. Let's show this to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren. Number two. If you've been waiting for some time about when's the right day to make that step to connecting point and to connect in and find out how I can get, become a part of the ministries of this church and be blessed by it and be a blessing to it, let me challenge you. Let this be the day that you join me and pastors and staff back here. We'd love to get to know you better. Would you rise for the benediction? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. 
May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. God bless you as you go.